Welcome to the last week of the term. We're all excited. Hopefully a lot of us are coming to commencement and or graduation. That will be a lot of fun. Yours truly with the MC for the biology commencement. So it um, should be very low key um, and not too many really bad jokes. Today we'll talk about giant viruses on Wednesday Jared, who's sitting in the back, will talk a little bit about virophages, and then I will have a little bit of probably extra filler material, since um, virophages are tiny, and actually there's not been that much literature on them, so um, it'll be, <clears throat> I'm really interested to hear what he's going to have to say. It's really connected to the giant viruses, which is kind of why we're doing the scheduling this way. Then, of course, Friday, there will be review all old stuff, um, no clicker questions that day, but I will have some today. I don't know if Jerry's going to plan on doing any on Wednesday or not. We'll let you know, um, and we'll try and record it if he's okay with that. Then on Tuesday, next week, so a week from tomorrow, 8 a.m. here, the final 50 multiple choice questions <clears throat> just on the last section. Um, so no specific questions based on the earlier parts of the course, but as George Kaysen told you, Stedman just loves to have comparative questions, so those comparative questions could be on, um, based basically on viruses that we talked about in this section of the course, but certainly assuming that you've at least maintained some of the information from the previous parts of the course. So any questions about you know, last week, finals, et cetera, stuff? Okay, then are there any questions about <clears throat> the retroviruses? Yeah, oh, sorry. Office hours on Monday. Uh, probably first thing, um, I'm actually getting on a plane and flying to San Diego at about noon. So um, best, best thing to do is to, uh, would be to email me and I'll have to see scheduling wise. If I do have any, it'll be just nine o'clock in the morning like 9 to 10. Okay, other questions about sort of next week, how that will work. And I will do my best to post keys and get things graded ASAP. I'll be back on Wednesday, so. Okay, so retroviruses. Again, the big take-home message here really has to do with the replication process, how you go from a positive strand RNA, or actually really two positive strand RNAs to double-stranded DNA and getting it into the genome. And then once you're there, it's really cellular processes which transcribe that, and then it gets exported, and I'll probably talk a little bit more about this on Friday because I think it didn't do a terribly good job of that, particularly the presence of that Rev protein that helps get the full-length unspliced genome out into the cytoplasm because Usually splicing has to happen in the nucleus before you have that RNA allowed to be exported. And in this case, you don't want to be splicing your whole genome because it's got to get out of the nucleus somehow. So that's the real key part about the, the Rev protein. Um, the other thing I wanted to emphasize was that at the very end, anybody have a chance to look at the video, um, the animation? If you haven't, I do highly recommend it. It's a great review for thinking about retrovirus, the one I had linked at the very end, the Vimeo one. One of the very important aspects about that is at the very end when you have your virion that's released from the cell, it's actually not completely done and infectious at that point. You still have proteolysis taking place of particularly the GAG protein, but also the gag pol polyprotein in order to split up all the individual proteins, and that eventually will form the capsid and then everything else that goes with the rest of the virion. So that final maturation step that takes place outside of the cell is really critical for these retroviruses. Okay, those are the particular things that I wanted to emphasize. Today, giant viruses. Well, just sort of getting bigger and bigger and bigger to some extent um, through this section of the course. Had some little side trips to the SSDNA viruses and the archaeal viruses. But just in general, sort of following on the pox viruses, and as we'll see, these giant viruses actually are quite closely related at a molecular level to the pox viruses that we've already talked about. 
Um, one difference is that most of them have icosahedral symmetry, even though they are ginormous, again, in terms of virion, but also in terms of genome size. Talk a little bit about how these giant viruses probably play a role in climate change. So yes, they're giant viruses, but we're talking about a virus scale here. So the effects that they have on sort of global, or at least the very least regional and weather issues, is still pretty amazing. We're still under microns in most cases. Um, again, very large genomes, and this discussion of these giant viruses, I think kind of brings us full circle in terms of what we talked about in lecture one, you know, what is a virus and what's present in viral genomes. These giant viruses seem to be kind of breaking the mold in terms of what people generally consider to be viruses. So our key concepts for today, um, NCLDVs just kind of rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Yeah. Nuclear cytoplasmic large DNA viruses, absolutely horrible acronym, but uh, that's what people have decided to group these viruses under. Um, I actually prefer gyruses, which is what one of my French colleagues came up for them, but that's not the approved nomenclature, so they're nuclear cytoplasmic large DNA viruses. Um, how abundant are they? Extremely, particularly in oceans, and in fact one of the things that was found, even I didn't have a chance to add to today's lecture, um, very, very recently is that in some of the global surveys that people have been doing looking at virus genes in the environment, um, right at the very beginning, again, we had all those little dots, remember those little dots? Well, actually, those little dots are too small for most of what people consider these giant viruses. A lot of these giant viruses were missed because they actually were retained by those filters because they're so large. And so there are quite a lot of giant viruses present in the environment that people hadn't discovered before, but now they're going back and looking at slightly larger particles, and we're finding that there are lots of these giant viruses in the environment as well. The virions are quite different, even though they've got this regular icosahedral shell on the outside. Many of them have internal lipids. And we've already seen internal lipids for STIV before, but these are, you know, very sort of unifying feature of many of these giant viruses. The way that the viruses release their genomes is rather fancifully named Stargate, but I think it's a pretty good name, um, and I should have brought my silver spoon that my mother-in-law made for me. It actually has a stargate, a viral stargate on the end of it. Next time. Um, and then virophage, which we'll hear about on Wednesday. And then um, CRISPR, we may get to that today. Turns out that a number of these giant viruses actually encode their own CRISPR systems, which is really fascinating. So, uh, <clears throat> Nuclear cytoplasmic large DNA viruses, I'm not quite sure how I got that mixed up there, um, but nuclear cytoplasmic large DNA viruses, um, these are sort of the ones that we'll talk about today. The FICO DNA viruses, again, the people who work on these love to, in my opinion, mispronounce them. They call them phycodenoviruses, um, but FICO being the algal DNA viruses, Coccolithoviruses, these are those which infect coccolithophores. These are also marine algae, but have these amazing plates, calcite plates around them. Mimiviruses and megaviruses, and then sort of, you know, bigger and bigger and bigger for a couple of years, about, actually almost about 10 years ago now, it was sort of like, well, my giant virus is bigger than your giant virus. There was, uh, every year or so, there were new ones that were coming out. Um, so mimivirus was the original giant virus followed by megavirus, and then Pandora virus even bigger than that, and pithovirus even larger than that. So why do we call them, and again, sorry about the typo up here, uh, nuclear cytoplasmic large DNA viruses? Um, that's because they replicate in either the nucleus or the cytoplasm, and they're large DNA viruses. Um, large particularly in the first one of these that was characterized were actually these pox viruses. And the pox viruses is approximately the size of the virion of some of these pox viruses. Um, 
if you're interested in reading more in the book, there's a whole chapter on baculoviruses, which are large DNA viruses that are related, distantly related, but still related to pox viruses. These are insect viruses, iridoviruses, phycoDNA viruses, mimiviruses, and ASFAR viruses. These ASFAR viruses, again, we're not going to talk about it in any more detail, but these are really decimating the pig population in China. Um, huge issue. African swine fever virus is a major issue and kind of spreading throughout the world. So all of these are related to each other, but very, very distantly related to each other, but clearly all of them related to each other to the exclusion of any other kinds of viruses. Um, again, very large, mostly icosahedral, but not all having icosahedral symmetry, and um, very large genomes as well. So we'll start out talking about these phycoDNA viruses. So phycoDNA viruses, they're algal viruses, and I just put the algal viruses in quotes because it turns out that there are a number of these viruses that are very closely related to the viruses that infect algae that don't, in fact, um, infect a lot of the algae. But really important here, and this is getting back to the idea of global mechanisms, is that probably 50% of the world's oxygen is produced by marine algae. Some of that's bacteria, some of it's eukaryotic algae. So really critical for life as we know it, you know, oxygenated atmosphere, et cetera. But those algae, again, both the eukaryotic algae and the cyanobacteria, probably 20% of those are killed every day through virus infection and some kind of viral lysis process. And what that means is, not surprisingly, the viruses play a really big role in terms of how much oxygen we have and we breathe. And some people have done some back of the envelope calculations, say about 20% you know, of the oxygen that we breathe is probably dependent on a virus infection of some kind. We talked about this a little bit way back at the beginning. We talked about the cyanophage that bring in some photosynthetic genes. Uh, but you know, this regulation of the amount of oxygen in our atmosphere um, is really, really dependent on a lot of these viruses. So how do we know about these phycoDNA viruses in more detail? You know, yes, they're present in lots of places, but really the pioneer in this study was a by the name of Jim Van Etten, who claims to be the only member of the National Academy of Sciences in the state of Nebraska, and is very proud thereof. Uh, he decided that he wanted to study these viruses infecting algae, but basically pretend that they were bacteriophage. And so he took these chlorella alga, and so the chlorella alga here, they're eukaryotic algae. Um, here there is one of these sort of spheres right here represents one chlorella. They live inside paramecium. So this is a paramecium cell, but inside the paramecium are these chlorella. But you can grow the chlorella outside of the paramecium as well. Um, but it turns out that whenever you go out to a pond, you find a paramecium, you'll find in that paramecium these algae which have colonized it, and that's how they gain actually a lot of their energy is the photosynthate. That photosynthate they take from the algae and use to grow. But what they're able to do with this, and they being mostly Jim Van Etten, was to do plaque assays. So nice, beautiful plaque assay. Now it's a green plaque assay. Each of these little dots represents an infection by one of these Paramecium berseria chlorella viruses. Um, and they're so easy to work with that this is actually a picture from my lab. Here's some chlorella actually growing um, in my lab upstairs. Um, really easy to work with. You can get very large quantities of them, um, and they're really big, relatively speaking, in terms of virions. So that's where PBCV1 um, was from. The genome sequence was done of this. It, the genome, just in terms of its general topology, looks a lot like the pox virus genome. Linear, double-stranded, with these hairpin ends, so probably is replicating very similar to pox viruses and, to some extent, the parvoviruses with little nicks and then extensions of those nicks um, going around the whole genome and relinking back to itself. So in terms of the overall structure, 
pretty similar. It's a bit bigger. Um, this one is 300,000 base pairs, which at the time people thought was really big. Now we, it kind of pales in comparison to some of the other giant viruses. Uh, but a couple of things that were found in that genome that were really quite surprising. Um, the first of them is it had 11 tRNA genes. And so this goes back again to when we talked about, you know, what viruses code for and what viruses don't code for. You know, viruses are all dependent on cellular translation machinery. So they have to have cellular translation. But how much of that cellular translation has been one of the things that in the study of these giant viruses, people have said, hmm, no, it looks as if there's actually less and less of the translation machinery that viruses are going to be dependent on, and they're bringing more and more of it with them. Um, tRNAs are kind of classic, and in fact, people had found some one or two tRNA genes in some of these giant virus genomes before. That really makes sense to have a new tRNA gene, because if your virus genome is using slightly different codons than the host genome, that makes a lot of sense, because then once the virus comes in, the virus would like to translate all of its genes, and so if it's got different codon usage than the cellular genes, if it brings in a lot of its own tRNAs, then the cellular ribosome is going to get confused, it's going to use all the viral tRNAs as opposed to the host tRNAs. So it makes a lot of sense to bring in tRNAs. Um, what makes less sense is why bring in a ubiquitin gene? Ubiquitin is usually involved in cell signaling, also in degradation processes. Why would you have ubiquitin? Um, why would you encode lots of transporter proteins? Usually, again, viruses aren't supposed to be involved in metabolism, but here they're transport, encoding lots of transporters. Whether you need them, why you need them is not entirely clear. And then these genomes also have some self-splicing introns. And in fact, this genome has the smallest known self-splicing intron, which turned out to be really useful for people who are doing studies on RNA evolution and RNA world kinds of processes. So that's what you see in the genome of PBCB1. The structure is <clears throat> almost quasi-equivalent icosahedron, but it's made up of these slightly different structures. Um, and these are diagrammed up here at the top, what are called trisimetrons. Each of these different colored triangles here is a group of one single protein, BP54, the name is not important, but it's a single protein which fits together first to make these triangular faces, again, as it were for an icosahedron, but they're offset. Because a normal icosahedron, all of these faces would be exactly symmetrical relative to each other. These are now a little bit offset. And the other thing that originally, when they did the structure, they thought that it looked like a regular icosahedron, but that's because just like what happened with MS2, they did icosahedral averaging. And then when they went back and did asymmetric reconstructions, they saw that it had a little spike at one end. This structural protein um, is near and dear to me because it's got two beta barrels. And this two beta barrel structure should sound really, really familiar. Why? I'm just going to bring down my models because I've printed a whole bunch of them. Why do I care so much about it? Because this is what you see, and I'm not going to go down the list. Um, in bacterial viruses, PRD1, superimposable structure. Adenovirus, eukaryotes, and archaeal viruses, STIV. So this structure right here, the two beta barrels, um, and again, I could have brought down my models here as well. This is superimposable with a bacterial virus. This is infecting algae. It's superimposable with bacterial virus infecting bacteria and superimposable with STIV infecting archaea. No sequence similarity, no detectable sequence similarity whatsoever. So more evidence that these things have derived from some kind of common ancestor. Yes, convergence is a possibility. 
but we certainly know that there are other ways that you can get these kinds of things to happen. This spike actually turned out to be very important for understanding the infection process because even though it's really tiny relative to what you would see with you know, our friends bacteriophages, the actual entry process of these viruses is very similar to what you see in bacteriophage. Um, and the reason for that seems to be that you know, these algae, particularly the eukaryotic algae, have very thick cell walls on the outside. So they're a lot like what you see with bacteria. So a lot of the bacteriophage have these long tails to get through the bacterial external wall. Well, turns out that this spike is important for getting through the algal cell wall. The algal cell wall um, actually is not being, there's no hole that gets poked through with this spike. The spike actually has a bunch of enzymes on it. And so what those do is actually physically degrade the wall structure of the algae. And you can see that in these micrographs here. So here's a PBCV1 virion. First attaches, presumably through the spike, you can't see it here. Then the cell wall starts to get degraded. And then you have a fusion that takes place. And the fusion here, as I mentioned before, many of these giant viruses have internal lipids. So there's a protein capsid on the outside, icosahedrally symmetric, but a lipid bilayer on the inside of that. And that lipid bilayer then ends up fusing with the plasma membrane of the cell, and the genome is released inside the cell. The rest of the capsid stays on the outside. So this looks a heck of a lot like what people saw with those bacteriophages. So, you know, the bacteriophage particle comes down, genome gets injected inside the cell, and the capsid is left on the outside. You see exactly the same thing here. Once that genome gets released inside the cell, that genome gets transported probably along microtubules, that's still not entirely clear, to the nucleus, and then has some extra enzymes that are associated with that structure, which then degrade all of the host DNA and the viral DNA is made. All of that viral DNA is being made and then assembled in a virus factory. So we saw the virus factories when we talked about pox viruses a couple of lectures ago. This is a separate, really kind of a new organelle that forms inside the cell where you have assembly of virus particles. So this guy, the genome goes to the nucleus, once it gets to the nucleus, it starts spitting stuff out of the nucleus, and that then will reassemble in a separate organelle. And then once they've assembled in these separate organelles, here you have the nucleus. Here it's one of those. Um, the organelle, we'll see the factory a little bit better later on, starts to assemble all of these virions, and then the cells will burst, and all of these virions will be released. Again, very similar to what you see with bacteriophage. I actually was looking in the microscope at one point in some of our algal cell cultures because you can see algal cells. Algal cells are great because they're really big um, under one of these infection processes. And I literally saw one burst at one point. So I could actually see lysis happening in a single cell. It was really cool. Unfortunately, I didn't have a video on it at the time. But we'll, we'll do that at some point a little bit later on. So that's um, PBCV1, just going through that whole process. And again, functions really very, very much like a bacteriophage, except that it's now infecting um, an alga. Some of the other algal viruses that have been very well studied are these coccolithophore viruses. So Emiliano Huxleyi is one of the most common of these coccolithophores. Coccolithophores have these um, plates around the outside, sort of armor plating. This particular one also has a virion associated with it. That's what this blob is right there. So it gives you also a bit of an idea of the scale here. These coccolithophores are very prevalent in the oceans. Usually you can't see them, but if you have virus infection, what happens? You lose all of these plates. If you lose all of these plates, they start to reflect, and particularly reflect light. If you have a big enough group of algae that are lysed by viruses, you can literally see these from space. And so one of my colleagues, um, Willie Wilson, um, calls this a um, global plaque, so a plaque on planet Earth. You can literally see um, the 
product of viral infection. Um, this is just off the coast of England. Um, his lab is here in Plymouth, um, and this is Cornwall right here. Um, so these are all lysed coccolithophores releasing all of these plates, um, and you can literally see this happen. So very, very, very large numbers of viruses and large numbers of their hosts. Um, and in fact, you can see the remains of these kinds of algal blooms and the coccolithophore lysis in the White Cliffs of Dover. So I don't know how you've been to England or seen the White Cliffs, but these huge chalk cliffs, um, they're all leftover lysed algae. So a, you know, cliffs as evidence of viral infection, which I think is just really fascinating. So not just in the geological record, um, it turns out that this lysis process of Emiliana Huxleyi, um, what that does is it releases a number of chemicals, particularly dimethyl sulfate and <clears throat> other chemicals, which then are released into the atmosphere. These now form aerosols which can start to nucleate water particles. Those water particles start to form clouds, and those clouds then shut down the photosynthesis. Now, why would this be an important process? Well, if you think about it from a control mechanism, all of these algae, they're photosynthesizing. So they need sunlight. If you kill off these hosts, you end up blocking the sunlight. So it's not just the viruses killing off the host, it's also the viruses belong, the, actually not the viruses themselves, but the outcome of virus lysis, which slows down the growth because you have less light coming in. So ways that you're controlling the amounts of algae, both directly and indirectly, and this indirect process, again, can also have climatic implications. What's going to happen with ocean acidification when you aren't going to have all of these calcareous shells forming around some of these um, coccolithophores? So you're not going to have these kinds of controls. What happens in terms of more global warming, I think, is a really open question. So. Um, What's going on here? Viruses are doing a great job at controlling these algal blooms, but you know, less algae, more algae. At this point, nobody really knows what's going to be happening um, as far as this process. So now let's focus in on the individual virus, the virus genome. Emiliana Huxleyi, virus 86. That means you've got lots and lots of them. Um, genome's also been sequenced. 400,000 bases, so we're getting even bigger in terms of genomes. Look at the sequences. The vast majority of them don't match anything else in databases. We do have its own DNA-dependent RNA polymerase, but probably the most surprising of the genes to be found in these E. Huxley I genomes were ceramide biosynthesis genes. Okay, what the heck is ceramide? Any of you know what ceramide is? I didn't when I put these lectures together. So ceramide is a particular lipid that's found in, sort of in place of cholesterol in lots of membranes, particularly of these marine algae. But the ceramide that's made by the virus, actually, or sorry, the virus genes, I should say, is different than the cellular ceramides which are made. And ceramide is often made as a signal which leads to apoptosis. So the production of ceramide and this is true in, in other organisms as well, leads to this apoptotic process. Probably it's the synthesis of ceramide, which happens when you have virus infection, which leads to the lysis, because the lysis actually is not blasting open the cells. In this case, lysis is due to apoptosis of the cells. That process, this unique ceramide, which is made by the viral proteins, is now being used to follow where viruses are in oceans. Turns out it's really easy to measure lipids and then be able to differentiate exactly which this ceramide is. 
And so a number of oceanographers now, when they head out into the oceans, they're trying to figure out who's there. Instead of sequencing the DNA, if you just see this one particular ceramide, you can say, oh, OK, this virus um, happened to be here. So uh, it's a <clears throat> neat process that has now turned out to be a, a really nice label to use for, for global oceanography. Uh, but this uh, ceramide is also something that could potentially be maintained in a rock record for over millions to billions of years. So we've actually been trying to find some of this also in rocks to see um, how old some of these viruses might be. Okay, those are the algal viruses. Any questions on the algal virus? Yeah. I'll... So how does the virus get past the hard shell? Um, probably, and this is, again, this is a little outside my area of expertise, these viruses actually undergo multiple, uh, sorry, the algal undergo, algae undergo multiple different phases, some of which when they have these shells on the outside and some of which they don't. And so probably the infection happens before they get the shells on the outside. Um, remind me, and I'll, I'll try and find, there's this really kind of fun comic that in fact the same group out of University of Nebraska came up with, um, which has all of these you know, various E. Huxleyi monsters and the viruses that are infecting them and the global battle for the oceans. Um, I'll see if I can find that. Yeah, Mika. Oh, it's a global plaque, yeah, back here. So this one, so if we get this to go back. Um, here, these guys. Yeah, so when you have these you know, E. huxleyi, or for that matter, any of these coccolithophores, where they've got the plates that are on the outside of the algae, those don't reflect very much because they're all sort of together and held in um, ways that you're not going to be reflecting light. As soon as you blast those open, each of those plates then comes apart, and that's where you start to see that. Okay, other questions on these guys? So what does this mean? Stedman's going to ask you a question, right? Okay, so clicker number one for today. <clears throat> the structure of the PVCV1 major capsid protein is most similar to the major capsid protein of lambda, herpes simplex virus, sulfobus turdidicosahedral virus, SV40, or tobacco mosaic virus. I think we've got more than 20 people here today. There we go. 10, 5, 3, 2, 1. We do not have a consensus, so let's get a consensus. Tell your neighbors what you selected and why. See, because that's always Stedman's answer, right? Okay, let's do another round. And again, feel free to chat again with your neighbors about what you think. 
10. Four, three, two, one. Okay, we're split between lambda and STIV. We actually really didn't even talk about the structure of the lambda virus major capsid protein. So um, herpes virus, we also didn't talk about. SV40, yes, usually the answer is large T antigen, but I didn't put large T antigen there. And TMV is <clears throat> an RNA virus. So just by process of elimination, you would end up by STIV, but this is the one where you've got archaeal viruses, bacterial viruses, and eukaryotic viruses with very, very similar major capsid proteins. So C it is. Okay, so now I want to switch gears, talk about the Mimi viruses and co, the really, really, really big virions. Uh, these are so big that you can actually see them under the light microscope, the virions themselves. These, this is one of my favorite micrographs here, admittedly. Um, this is stained, but again, it's a nucleic acid binding stain of an infected cell. In this case, it's amoeba. Almost all of these giant viruses are infecting amoeba. And you see all of these little dots. Um, each of these little dots represents one virion. This is the virus factory. And then you turn off the fluorescence. You can even see all these little dots in here. You know, literally, in the light microscope, you can see virions. And that was partly because, was a, part of the reason, actually, that it took a long time for people to discover these viruses, because they just were too big. And you know, way back when, you know, definition of virus is very small infectious intracellular, infectious obligate intracellular parasite. Well, these weren't very small anymore. Um, in fact, they looked like bacteria. And in fact, that's why they're called Mimi viruses in the first place. They're mimicking bacteria. Mimicking bacteria not just in terms of their size, though, but probably also in terms of the infection process. They infect amoeba. What do amoeba do? They engulf things. What do amoeba eat? Bacteria. So probably the, these viruses are mimicking bacteria in order to get inside the amoeba so that they can end up infecting them. And again, the vast majority of these are infecting amoeba, but that's mostly just because that's what people have been using to try and isolate them. You know, whether they actually are infecting amoeba in their natural environments is still a pretty um, open question. So this is the light microscope up here. Um, in the electron microscope down here, here's one of those Mimi viruses inside one of the amoeba. And again, the amoeba, how do they eat things? They encompass them. Um, polyphaga, so phagocytosing, taking up these individual virions. Where did the first one come from? Um, actually came from a cooling tower outside of Bradford, England. That's why it was called Bradfordococcus bacterium, because that's they thought it was a bacteria um, in 1992. And then a French group started to work on this because they said, hey, these guys have a bacteria that they can't grow. Well, let's see if we can figure out how to grow it. Um, and two different um, French groups, uh, Didier Raoult's group and <clears throat> Um, spacing on his name now, come back to me later. Um, another French group, both in Marseille, um, were able to isolate amoeba, and this is from that original paper, with all of these virions associated with it. And this, just for comparison purposes, is a pox virus virion. Um, slightly bigger in terms of scale if you ignore those fibers on the outside, as soon as you include the fibers. So here are these hairs on the outside. That starts to be um, considerably larger. So it took them 11 years to figure out that this was a virus, and it was a really big deal um, in 2003 when it was actually published. A um, couple of things that were discovered. Um, a, huge virion. Um, at that point, it was by far the largest genome of any virus that anyone had found. Um, over a megabase pair in size, so almost 1.2 million base pairs. We'll see this a little bit later on. A few people said, is, how do you know that it's really a viral genome? Well, there are a couple things. A, it didn't have any ribosomal 
RNA in it, and so that was one of the definitions that you had. Uh, secondly, um, all of the genes were completely packed right next to each other. Also see that in some bacteria, uh, but here lacking that RNA gene. Um, had its own RNA polymerase. Curiously, had a few other things that other virus genomes did not have. Um, DNA repair proteins, lots and lots of DNA repair proteins for mismatch repair, um, et cetera. So that was a new thing. And then lots and lots of different translation proteins. So a bunch of tRNAs, but also amino acyl tRNA synthetases. So as everybody remembers from molecular biology, amino acyl tRNA synthetases are those enzymes that take an amino acid and put it onto the tRNA. So this is the, really that quality control step. And if you think back to the whole idea of why viruses are encoding tRNAs in the first place, that's because they've got a slightly different genetic code. But if they've got all these tRNAs, and the cell doesn't have enough amino acyl tRNA synthetases to put the right amino acid onto those tRNAs, it's not going to be that useful. So amino acyl tRNA synthetases, um, tRNAs, cap binding protein, so not an EIF4E, but a different cap binding protein, a number of other translational initiation factors as well. So we're getting kind of, you know, closer and closer to cellular translation and some people will say the only thing that's missing is the ribosome. And when we talked about virus definitions, you know, way back at the beginning, one of Patrick Forter's definition, in fact, Didier Raoul was one of the other ones involved in this paper, where he said, okay, you've got capsid encoding organisms and ribosome encoding organisms. So the capsid encoding organisms are the viruses, and the ribosome encoding organisms are the cells. Well, what if you're to find a virus that encodes a ribosome? That kind of throws all of this off. And this gets us back to, you know, we love to name and categorize things, but biology just does what it wants, or has been doing for four billion years. So whether that <clears throat> is an appropriate thing or not is still um, up in the air. But these guys definitely do encode capsids. And so these, is a, these are the capsid structure. That's Jean-Michel Claverie. So it's Jean-Michel Claverie and Didier Raoul. These were the two French groups that originally isolated the Mimi virus and <clears throat> then sequenced the genome. Um, since then, apparently, they're not even talking to each other. And one of them has their own giant virus, which is bigger than the other one's giant virus, and so on and so forth. Um, be that as it may, um, they were the ones who originally found these and have been continuing to do most of the work on them. So this is a really beautiful electron micrograph where you have a Mimi virus with a really clear icosahedral capsid with an internal membrane structure, and then all of these hairs coming off of it. And so the whole thing all the way across here is about 750 nanometers, um, but the actual capsid itself is only about, only about 400 to 450. Nonetheless, um, icosahedral symmetry, pseudo uh, P uh, 11,079, so you know, really, classic kinds of structure. So we've gone from the T equals one, um, really tiny icosahedrally symmetric viruses that you find in some plants, all the way up to these giant viruses, each of them with a very similar kind of geometry. So geometry is really well conserved for these guys. Um, what the fibers are for is really not clear. Again, probably it's important for fooling the poor amoeba into picking up these you know, viruses, which it thinks are food, um, and then these viruses then will infect the host. How they infect the host is a really interesting question. How do you get this genome out here? And then usually, you know, this is, these are getting picked up by the amoeba because the amoeba are going to eat these um, and are producing all kinds of enzymes to try and break down whatever is in their vacuoles. It turns out that the genome release that happens with these viruses is through this Stargate. Now, what the heck is the Stargate? Again, once you do reconstructions with cryo-EM of these structures, if you impose icosahedral symmetry, all you're going to see is an icosahedron. On the other hand, if you do asymmetric reconstructions, what you find is that one of the five-fold vertices of this icosahedron, you have a very different structure. So 
How many recognize what this is? Seen old TV shows. This is the Stargate. What about this one? Movies, Sigourney Weaver, eggs. So yeah, this is what the aliens came out of. This to me looks a heck of a lot like one of these aliens coming out of one of these eggs, but it's actually a scanning electron micrograph of one of these um, Mimi viruses and the genome coming out of that. So there's a nice <clears throat> animation of this. Oh, hang on, go back. Uh, sorry about that. Let's see if we can go to open this. Um, animation of now this reconstructed form of these Mimi viruses. So this is that Mimi virus from cryo-EM reconstructions with these nice five-fold axes, and then, yeah, you could count all of these and get up to 1,179 with your H and K numbers, uh, but at one axis, it has this Stargate um, that's associated with it. This is from Michael Rossman's lab, um, really the pioneer in virus structures, really at all. He started out doing X-ray crystallography and has now moved into doing more of these cryo-EM reconstructions, and unfortunately passed away a couple of weeks ago. Um, I think at the, the ripe old age of 88, apparently was in his lab like the day right before it. So um, in honor of Michael Rossman, I kind of had to show that. We don't need to look at this one. We may look at this giant virus one a little bit later on. Okay, let's go back to here. Um, so those are the stargates. Um, that's how the genome gets released. And in fact, it's not just the genome, just like you see with the FICO DNA viruses, actually this piece coming out here is probably that internal membrane, um, and that will then fuse with the amoebal membrane, then the genome um, comes out. So what does this replication cycle look like? Here's a cartoon up at the top. First you have the poor unsuspecting amoeba that thinks it's eating some bacteria. Um, once that happens, you have the release of the genome through the Stargate, you start to form these virus factories, around the virus factories, they produce lots of virions, and these virions are released. So you can see that here. This is now fluorescence versus light microscopy. Here's the happy amoeba. Once it picks up one of these genomes, it starts to form a virus factory that you can see actually mostly by DNA staining. More and more of the DNA factory as a virus factory, that vi virus factory starts to actually become larger than the nucleus. If you look at that now in the electron microscope, you'll see this really dense area, which is where you have protein production, you have DNA production, and then each of the particles which are being produced um, outside of that. And you can also see here, um, it appears that what happens is you make capsids, and then those capsids get this internal thing sort of hosted inside them, and probably again through the Stargate um, process. So this assembly, you have a bunch of empty virions, those then get filled with the internal structure um, <clears throat> at the end. So this is the scale. Yeah. Um, for this, um, I'm glad you opening it by using the Mhm. Mm yep. Yeah, so it, it fuses from the phagosome, gets into the cytoplasm. And then does the genome So in the case of the Mimi viruses, those genomes just seem to be able to, um, they are present inside the cytoplasm. They, many of them have their own RNA-dependent RNA polymerases. And so they actually can completely replicate in the cytoplasm. So it's a lot like what you see with pox viruses. So they don't actually even have to go to the nucleus. The PBCV1 is kind of the exception. That one does go to the nucleus. So that's why I should have emphasized those RNA-dependent RNA polymerases. I went over at RDRP on there. Those are actually also present in virions. Okay, so this is the overall cycle. These are these giant viruses replicate. Now I want to go through a bit of a rogues gallery on you know, my giant virus is bigger than your giant virus. So <clears throat> This was um, a couple of years after the Mimi virus came out. Again, every year someone was coming up with a larger virus. Now the megavirus, Chiliensis, um, 
slightly bigger genome, seven amino acid tRNA synthetases, um, mostly similar to the Mimi viruses, but also has a very similar kind of shape. Um, I like this one. It kind of looks as if the Stargate is, is already um, trying to open here right at this end. Um, but for yeah, a number of years, you had um, Jean-Michel Claverie and Didier Raoul each publishing a paper, you know, my, my virus is bigger than your virus um, kind of thing um, process over, over the years. All of them infecting amoeba. Um, so one of the things that people have argued about is are they really actually infecting amoeba or is just amoeba really good hosts for them? And so you isolate one of these things from the environment. In this case, it was off the coast of Chile. That's why it's called Chileensis. Um, and then they would just put it into their algal culture, uh, so their amoebal cultures, and see that they would replicate. But whether they were actually normally replicating in the environment in these amoeba, um, acanthamoeba um, polyphaga is actually really pretty easy to grow. I've been told, I haven't tried to grow it, uh, relative to lots of the other amoebas that you do find in the environment. So it's quite possible that these viruses are actually not infecting amoeba in their natural environment. I need a drink of water. <laughs> Something else probably too. So we'll do, let's get everybody a, some clicker points today. The Mimi virus genome was released from the virion via A, portal, transcription, Stargate, virus-associated pyramid, or SV40 large T antigen. It's always the answer, right? SV40 large T antigen. I don't usually give participation points, but this is probably just about as close to a participation point as we're going to get. Anyone else want to click? Good. We'll stop. Yes, of course, it's C because it's always C whenever Stedman comes up with a question. Um, the Stargate. I have to try to remember it. So one of the things I try and do on my exams is actually go back and alphabetize them because I do find that when I'm coming up with answers, I very often end up with C as being the correct one. Um, so, but I'll try not to have that on the exam. So don't just go all the way up and down and do C's all the way through. Don't recommend that. Okay, I'm going to skip this slide because this is what we're going to hear about on Wednesday. Um, mega viruses and other viruses can get sick. Um, even bigger viruses, um, forget if this one, I think this was also Cleverie's group. Uh, these are the Pandora viruses. Uh, the scale bar here is 200 nanometers. If you're thinking about Mimi virus on this scale, it would be about this big. So this is almost two and a half times the size of a Mimi virus virion, also infecting amoeba, also being made through um, these virus factories, which you can see over on the right-hand side here, and not surprisingly, also um, easily, visi easily visible excuse me, in the light microscope as you can see over on the other side. These giant virions also have giant genomes. Two and a half million base pairs. Now, how does this relate to other kinds of genome sizes? The Pandora virus genome here is bigger than almost our allocale genomes, bigger than most bacterial genomes, and actually bigger than a few eukaryotic genomes. So the virus genome in and of itself is larger than even some of those. Um, also, double-stranded linear genome packed with proteins, many of them not similar to any other proteins, but still a distant relative of the Mimi etc., um, those other giant viruses. So it's got a completely different, now this is not looking icosahedral at all, uh, but the gene sequences that are present in it are still relatively similar. This discovery um, had a few of these researchers saying that, well, actually what these viruses represent, the giant viruses in general, but particularly the Pandora viruses, they're actually cells which have lost their translation machinery. So they're descendants of a fourth domain of life. So it wasn't just bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. There were some other sets of cells 
which then lost their ability to survive by themselves and they became these viruses. Most of us don't buy this, um, and there are a couple of reasons for that. One is that these virus sequences are clearly similar to other virus sequences as well, and a lot of the extra genes that they've picked up turn out to be genes that look like they're cellular genes. So if you do a phylogeny, it is what seems to have happened, a lot of these giant viruses have actually accumulated lots of genes into their genome, many of which are cellular genes and not viral genes. Um, and if we have time on Wednesday, I'll talk about a brand new theory that um, Patrick Fortier um, just came out with in terms of viral origins. Yeah? Are there any regions where you see a gene that looks like a viral that looks very, very viral that seems to have the same genes as other ones? Yeah. So the, the question is, you know, what about the other way around? Um, do you have some kind of maybe yeah, parasitic um, bacteria, obligate intracellular bacteria, coxiella, rickettsia, something like that, um, that looks like it was mostly viral genes and then picked up a ribosome? Um, so far, no, but yeah, <laughs> but how could, how could that have happened? And then why, why is the ribosome so important? Good question. Um, I think the answer is we don't know. But certainly if you look at a lot of the parasitic bacteria, again, the, the coxiellas and the rickettsias of this world, um, they're clearly derived from free-living organisms that were actually, and they've just lost a bunch of genes, whereas these seem to be accumulating genes. So again, depends a lot on your phylogenies and how you do those analyses, but that does seem to be what's going on. So that brings us to um, a couple of other things that people have found more recently. Um, this is a paper from a couple of years ago where people went to a sewage treatment plant, because that's where you go to get viruses, of course, because as we know it's a great place to find viruses. But now they weren't looking for bacteriophage, they were looking for giant viruses. And they found a whole new family of giant viruses that have almost sufficient numbers of amino acyl tRNA synthetases and tRNAs for almost enough to make actual, you know, full protein complements, but no ribosomes. And they looked really hard to try and find any kind of ribosomal sequences um, unsuccessfully. Um, there's a group in <coughs> University of British Columbia um, particularly Christoph Gieg, um, who's been working with Curtis Suttle. He almost came here and did his PhD in my lab, but um, went up to UBC instead. Um, found this um, really fascinating virus now that infects Bodo Saltans, which is a um, marine but also brackish freshwater organism, not an amoeba, um, that infects, um, also has amino acyl tRNA synthetases. Curiously enough, this one doesn't have any tRNA, so it steals all of them from its host. But otherwise, this is really sort of classic giant virus format. Uh, but also, a um, curiously, this genome is absolutely packed with extra genes. And these extra genes turns out to have been put in as a sort of selfish elements. And so, you know, how do you, how do you incorporate genes, which would be an you know, interesting question that you could have asked. Um, how are they picking up genes? Well, in this case, they have their uh, homing endonuclease. So homing endonucleases, basically what they do is they will um, serve kind of like a transposon. So they will grab a particular piece of DNA and move it and put it in somewhere else in their genome or even in the host genome as well. And so this particular virus is loaded with these repeated sequences due to basically multiplication of a transposon inside its genome. So that's clearly how it's accumulating genes, and this particular genome has been accumulating very large numbers of genes as well. Same time, people have been looking for even bigger viruses. Um, this is the pithovirus, now the largest Virion, curiously enough, actually is a relatively small genome. It's actually smaller than the Pandora virus genome, but it's 1.5 microns in size. So again, pushing the size of a bacteria. More giant viruses were found just last year. 
Um, these are now head and tail viruses, also infecting amoeba, but instead of just having the Mimi virus like head, they also have these massive tail structures present at the ends of their genomes. 70 tRNAs, 20 amino acyl tRNA synthetases, everything except the ribosome. And then the very last of the giant viruses I wanted to talk about was one that was discovered just this year. The Medusa virus, anybody any of seen the reporting on this? The Medusa virus turns its host to stone when they stare at it. Well, also infects amoeba. One of the things that happens with amoeba, and how many of you, you know, know much about amoeba biology? I knew practically nothing until I started studying these viruses, or looking at the viruses anyway. Um, one of the things that many amoeba do is usually they're going to be going around, you know, engulfing things, and that's how they eat. But if the going gets bad, they encyst themselves. They basically make a cyst, and so they um, basically it's a sort of a spore, a way to survive for long periods of time. Many amoeba do this. And in fact, when you get infected by amoebas, often it's that cyst that you get. And Giardia is another really nice example. It's not an amoeba, but um, makes these cysts, and then you can get infected through that process. So this encystment is kind of like you know, forming a rock. And it turns out that when these amoeba get infected by these Medusa viruses, it turns on encystment. And so that's why they called them the Medusa viruses. They also have these interesting projections coming off of the virion. Um, sort of like the snakes coming off of Medusa's head in mythology. So they, they really like this as a possibility. Um, these genomes um, also encode histones, and they're histones that look very much like but deeply branching histones from eukaryotes. They've got H2A, H2B, H3, H4, and H1 all encoded in the viral genome. So at some point, you know, they've presumably picked up these genes from someone else, or they're a descendant of one of these other, you know, common ancestors. But that common ancestor would have to have had all five systems, cysteine, uh, ugh, all five histones. Um, these ones also encode cyclins, caspases. Um, T equals 277. You can do the calculations. H equals 7. K equals 12. Um, and from a hot spring, they were really excited about being from a hot spring. Well. I went back and looked in the paper. The hot spring is at 43.5 degrees Celsius. Remember those archaeal viruses? Anybody working in the mutant viruses from hell? 80 degrees Celsius. This isn't hot at all. It's like a warm spring. Um, wouldn't call it anything beyond that. So I think we will stop here. We'll let Jared talk about the virophages on Wednesday. And I'll have a few other things as well. Probably finally get to all these extra slides that I keep sticking at the ends of my lectures <laughs> um, for the last few weeks. Um, and then review on Friday. <laughs>